Uh, if you found this through Twitter, I know that we had sort of leaked this to Twitter a little bit early and you want to see more Codas Craft events coming up. Uh, our engineering blog is called Codas Craft. It's at codascraft.etsy.com. And at the top of the page, you can get to our uh, mailing list registration. So sign up on there. Uh, I want to thank Ryan Young and Gabriella and Ari from our engineering team who have helped out set up all the chairs and all the other stuff here today, tonight. And Sarah Cohen, who does logistics for all of our, uh, all of our events here. Um, thank you to all of them for helping out tonight. We also have a number of engineers in the audience who are all wearing uh, orange stickers. So uh, afterwards, if you want to um, chat with anybody about what we're doing at Etsy, hear some stories, uh, I guarantee they're all very friendly people. And they will not bite you. Uh, tonight, we have Steve Souders. <laughs> and I know Steve, uh, Steve came on my radar when he was working at Yahoo on, on YSlow. That was probably one of the first things I saw that I, that I recognized him from. But you probably know him from the various books that he's written and blog posts, uh, the various utilities, which he was talking about marketing today at, at QCon. Um, he's, he uh, has displayed a great marketing prowess. Um, also, HTTP Archive, which is his tool for uh, tr uh, watching trends of, of web performance on a variety of different sites across the internet. It's currently tracking about 200,000 URLs. Uh, and that's been running for almost two years. Yeah. Oh my God. And he's also uh, the co-chair of the Velocity Conference, which if you're unfamiliar with it, is, is centered around performance and, and operations. And it is running next week. Nearly sold out. And if you're really nice to Steve, he may give you a discount code so you can get in. Uh, before it does sell out. So uh, tonight we actually have a somewhat different talk than what we had advertised. Uh, Steve's going to be talking about front end single points of failure, which is a very timely uh, subject. So, and we're going to have uh, questions, time for questions at the end. So if you could just sort of hold off on those if, you, if they come up. And if you please give a warm welcome to Steve Souders. Thank you. Thank you. All right, thank you very much, Mike. Very excited to be here. Um, there's so many important things we need to cover tonight. I just, I don't know where to start. I think probably the most important thing to mention is as I was leaving the house uh, yesterday morning, my wife said, make sure to tell them I love Etsy. So. Um, and is Mark Hedlund here? I saw Mark do a talk about the code camp that you guys run. What's it called? Hacker School. And if people don't know about that, uh, you know, I recommend you stop an Etsy engineer and ask about it. It's been uh, extremely helpful uh, doing something that um, we have not been, as an industry, very successful at, of getting uh, women into technology. And they've hit uh, not just a home run, I think it's like a grand slam combination of a grand slam during a perfect game sort of uh, serendipity. So then let's see, let's move on to the next thing. So this is my website. How many people here go to my website? Cool, kinda. <laughs> and uh, I always post all my slides. You can click here and see all my talks for the last five years. Um, but the slides for tonight are up here. And so if you don't catch all the URLs and stuff like that, you can always download them uh, later. And so let's go to the slide deck and we'll get this guy going. Boom. I love that picture. So people who saw me today aren't going to laugh at this. Actually, people who saw me today didn't laugh at it either. But, <laughs> but that won't stop me from saying it again. <laughs> Is It's really important during the talk um, not so much to focus on what I say or the words on the slides, but to focus on the pictures in the background. <laughs> because they're all very relevant. And pictures are what is really going to stick in your mind. So, you know, it's a sunken ship. So how did, how did someone else sink my ship? Was it a torpedo? Kind of. It was a front end torpedo. So yeah, I'm going to talk about SPOF tonight. Um, so SPOF is single point of failure. Uh, it's, you know, we're all familiar with that phrase, uh, a chain is only as strong as its weakest link. Um, and so in computer parlance, the word for that is SPOF. 
And most of the time when we think of uh, SPOF, single point of failure, we think of uh, hardware architectures or network architectures. So here's the canonical SPOF diagram from Wikipedia in which we have a bunch of clients trying to connect to a server and uh, they're doing that through one and only one router. And if that router goes down, then guess what? The whole system is down and that's a single point of failure. What Wikipedia doesn't point out is there's actually only one app server too in this diagram, so that's a single point of failure as well. And so we're all kind of familiar with this, and anyone who's worked on a big website um, you know, has tackled this problem early, 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 early on. The cloud helps with this. Um, we, as computer engineers of uh, systems that have high uptimes, we know to look out for these uh, hardware and network type of single point of failures. But um, I want to talk about a different type of single point of failure. I call it a, a front end spoff. And so uh, I don't know about you, but when I look at a website like this, I go, ooh, like, I know they have not protected themselves. So there's a few things going on here that tell me that they definitely have the potential for single point of failure, and I'll give anyone 10 to 1 odds uh, that they actually have single point of, front end single point of failure in here. And so I notice that when I see these things like widgets um, showing up, like, most widgets don't have a way to load them that doesn't avoid a single point of failure. And even if they do, they usually did it second and everyone has the first snippet pattern. Um, so they're doing it in a bad way. Certainly ads, almost every ad uses document.write. That's gonna be a single point of failure. And you can't see it, but this page is using um, analytics. And the way they're using those analytics are also providing an opportunity for a single point of failure. So, um, when I say a single point of failure, like um, again, most of the time we're thinking about hardware and networking. We're thinking about you know, the backhoe tearing underground and pulling the power cable out, or the you know, uh, board just catching on fire, or things like that. And for front end single point of failure, oh, I wanted to mention, again, pay attention to the photo. Uh, so why is it that this page has a single point of failure? Um, and it's, it's because they all rely on scripts, and scripts will block the page from rendering. Get it? Blocking. I knew you guys were sharp. Oh my gosh. Mike told me he was right. Um, so scripts, when, when the browser hits a script tag, it will stop rendering anything below the script tag until the script is done being downloaded, right? And so we have a lot of inconsistencies in browsers. How many people here work on the web? So. How many people here know browsers are inconsistent? Yeah, yeah. So, so there's one thing that they all agree on. They all block rendering when you hit a script tag. All of them, every browser. So we normally think of you know, single points of failure, catching on fire, backhoe tearing up the ground. This is a front end single point of failure, right? This is what happens when you have uh, errant uh, script that is blocking the page from rendering and it's taking a really long time. This is what the user sees. Now there's no fire, there's no flame, there's no smoke, there's no backhoe. Is this really a failure? Like, yeah, it is. Like, there's no question about it. This is a failure. This is a failure. You know, the user is not getting any feedback, any content, and normally this will go on for 20 to 120 seconds. Users are not gonna hang out for that, right? This is almost worse than the machines catching on fire, because when the machine catches on fire, the website is, responds immediately, I'm down. This is worse. It hangs out for 20 to 120 seconds before the browser times out, depending on the browser. So this is definitely a failure. So you know, this actually did happen to Business Insider. This is an actual screen dump. And how many people here work at Business Insider? <laughs> Sometimes I forget to ask that before I rant. All right, so now, now that I thought about that, how many people here work at Twitter? How many people here work at Facebook? All right, let the ranting begin. <laughs> okay, so this is Business Insider source code. It's like I'm from a month ago, so it's pretty recent. So they do have uh, the types of things I was talking about. They have analytics. Uh, here, this is uh, Quantcast. 
Uh, they're out of San Francisco. And it's very cool. They're doing the typical pattern that I think was made prominent by Google Analytics. You create a script element dynamically, you set the source, and then you attach it to the DOM. And when you attach it to the DOM, the download happens. And it just turns out that when you do this in every browser, at least every browser I've ever tested, the script will load asynchronously. What I mean more specifically about that is the browser will say, oh, I'm downloading a script, but since I'm doing it this way, I don't have to wait for it to come back. I can continue parsing the HTML document and rendering the rest of the page. I don't have to wait. So that's very cool. You have to think about, and we'll talk about this in a little bit, you have to think about asynchronous stuff, race conditions and callbacks and things like that. It's a different way of programming, but it's very cool if you want to promote a good user experience. So they have analytics that's uh, being done async. Here's more analytics, the Google Analytics uh, snippet. Um, that's very cool. And here they have uh, KISS metrics. Wow, they've got three sets of metrics going on in here. And they're doing that asynchronously, but what are they not doing asynchronously? Twitter! Script source equals blah, right? There's no async or defer attribute. This is a synchronous loading script. When the browser hits this script, it will not parse, it will not continue parsing past the script tag, generally. It definitely won't render anything past the script tag. So this is what is blocking Business Insider from rendering. This is what's blocking the page. This is what's causing a front end spoff, right? So this is going to be a failure. Like, it's not a question of if Twitter will ever go down and hang the page. It's when and how often. So I call this front end spoff. And I coined this phrase a couple years ago. And uh, it really had, didn't catch on too well. And now in hindsight, I realize I was bragging this morning about some cool names I've come up with. Yslow, Kazillion, Party Line, Browser Scope, Hammerhead, JDrop. I think those are all pretty cool names from an engineer. What? Sprite. Yeah, Sprite Me. Um, this is a terrible name. Like, <laughs> you know, I should have thought of a much better name for this, and then like maybe I'd get some credit for banging the drum around this. And we'll see that in a minute. Uh, so, I, but I call this front end spoff, kind of a generic name, and. Um, you know, so the question is like, uh, seriously, Steve, like how often does this actually happen? So here's a scenario where it happens 100% of the time. Here I'm using web page test. How many people use web page test? Okay, so we're not going to be able to continue um, because everyone needs to use web page test. So I don't know what to do. Like, if there's no other takeaway, I'm sad. Oh, I do actually kind of have a photo of web page test. If nothing else, this is what should stick in your mind from today's talk, is web page test is the most awesome performance tool out there. And I didn't even build it, so it's like I'm not just self-promoting. Um, it's really awesome, and you should do it. And it's got a lot of capabilities, and um, you can do amazing things with it. So um, I, I went to web page test, and I loaded Business Insider. And when it loaded, you'll notice it gives me a little uh, film strip view, is what we call it. Um, and the page is blank for 0, 10, 20, sometime between 20 and 30 seconds, it starts to partially render. So it's blank for at least 20, 25 seconds. Why is that? What's happening? Well, now we can go down into this waterfall chart, and green is where uh, rendering starts. You can see it's around 26, 27 seconds. And we see this red request. The UI here is a little off. It would be nice if they drew a bar that went all the way out here. But basically, a 12029 means that the socket connection timed out. right? And they don't draw a bar. I don't know why. There's probably not a browser event to know when a socket timed out. But this red line, this red bar, is what blocked rendering from happening until this point. Because I'm in IE. Uh, you can see that up at the top. It says IE7. And in IE, the timeout is 20 seconds. That's actually the fastest timeout of all the browsers I know. WebKit's 120 seconds, I'm pretty sure. So that's what caused this to uh, not render, to do front end spa for 25 seconds. Um, so how did I make this happen? Well, I loaded it from a web page test instance inside the Great Firewall in China. And guess what? China blocks Twitter.com. And so I have a blocking script, a script at the top of the page that's loaded synchronously in a city that will time out Twitter.com. And that means the entire page is going to be blank until, until that script times out. right? 
So I don't know if Business Insider isn't aware of this. I don't know if they don't have any readers in China. I've heard there's a lot of people there. I don't know. I'm sure someone there is trying to read Business Insider. And if they are, they're having to wait 20 to 120 seconds, depending on the browser, for the page to render. So this is not a good thing. Um, so you can make this happen 100% of the time. And the way I discovered this, I was actually in China. So I do know they have a lot of people. And, and I, I like, this is one of the 30 sites I open every morning. And it was like blank. And I'm like, what the heck is going on? And I figured it out. I was in the, behind the firewall. And they had third party scripts in the site. So whose fault is that? Who can we blame this failure on? That's a bad way to put it. But, but we're, here, we're here to rant, aren't we? So, so what causes this to happen? Well, certainly Business Insider, you know, they own it, right? It's their site. They decided to put third party stuff on their site. It's really, you know, regardless of whose fault it is, they're going to pay the price. But we can see how this might have come about the way it did. If we look at the Twitter documentation for anywhere.js, the pattern that they have at the top of the page is the exact pattern the Business Insider copied into their HTML document. And this is a synchronous blocking script in the head, no less. So remember, a sh the browser will only stop rendering the elements, the DOM elements, below the script tag. If you put your script tag above body, that means nothing in the page is rendered until the script is done. And that's exactly what's happening here. They've ha they have this in the head, and so nothing in the body will render until this script is returned. Inside China, that's going to time out, so you're going to have a blank page for a long time. So um, this is one thing we can do. If we want to try to examine like how uh, spoff likely, spoffable, spoff, uh, yeah, spoffy our sites are. We can run it. We can load it in a web page test from China. But that's kind of painful. Um, so uh, and how often would that actually happen? So well, suppose I'm not in China. Like many of us you know, probably work in the US. We work on sites that are mainly focused on US customers. So there's two seats right up here. Come on up. Seriously. Yeah. Or grab a beer first and then come up. And, and so luckily, I have this project that Mike mentioned, the HTTP archive. So I wanted to find, this was kind of a contrived example. I'm in China loading Business Insider. I can reproduce that 100% of the time. But how about in the US? How likely is it that this is going to happen? So for this HTTP archive, twice a month, I download 200,000 URLs into IE8, I think I'm doing right now. And so um, luckily, like you know, this is a public website. Anyone can go to it. You can download the data. I actually have all the data in a MySQL database that like, I can uh, tell that to you know, SSH2 anytime I want. So I wanted to find some examples of, for, for this talk of sites that had experienced SPOF just here in the US. So what do I do? I do this MySQL query. I say, let me select the URL and web page test ID uh, from this database. The tables are pages. There's two main tables. Pages is, it, it, there's 200,000 entries for each run in the pages table. In the request table are all of the individual HTTP requests or resources for each page. Each page on average has 80 requests. So there's 80 times 200,000, one and a half million uh, records in the request table for each, each uh, page. So I want to hit both of those tables. And I'm going to do uh, a constraint on the page ID to just be the run from May 1st. So this is the page IDs from May, May 1st. And we're join the two tables. And I only want to look at sites that are in the top 20,000 worldwide. Like I can give you examples that are down like in 150,000, 200,000 you've never heard of before. But I want to try to find some popular sites that actually experience SPOF. So they have to have a pretty high rank. And I'm going to look for a site that contains a script that took more than 10 seconds to return and where the page overall had more than a 10 second blocking of rendering. right? And I'm going to group them by page ID so I can see each uh, page individually. So why did I show you all of this MySQL? 
because people are actually downloading the data from the HCP archive and running their own studies and coming up with these performance observations and other observations about trending in the internet. And so like, it doesn't take that long. Like, it takes more than 15 minutes, but less than two hours to get the data downloaded and the schema up and going. And you can be doing queries like this left and right. It's really fun. Like, someone can ask a question that you would think would be really hard. Like, you know, what percentage of style sheets aren't gzipped? And like, in three minutes, I can tell you the answer to that. So it's kind of handy to have. So I did this query, and guess what? Um, there was a non-null result set. I found examples. So uh, here's, um, like they're not hugely popular sites, Beta Brand. Anyone go to Beta Brand? Looks like a pretty good site actually for clothes, yeah. And um, here they have, you know, it's blocked for rendering for somewhere between 10 and 15 seconds. Looks like right about the 15 second mark. And it's because uh, Facebook all.js took uh, one, 14 seconds to return. I don't know why. Like, you know, the internet isn't 100% reliable. Like, it hiccups every once in a while. Like, so there's 200,000, and I found about 200. So what's that, 0.1%? Like, that's a pretty good, you know, error rate, I would guess. About 0.1% of the time, you're going to run into these spoff conditions. Um, unless there's a major outage. We'll get to that in a minute. Uh, so here's another one. This guy was blocked from rendering for 26 seconds, waiting on... Google and Facebook. OK, it was Google, yeah. We don't know why. They're both slow. Um, this one blocked for 23 seconds waiting on uh, glam.com. Anyone work at glam.com? It's the world's leading curator of social media content. They are not the world leading web performance media site. <laughs> So here's, they have a script that took uh, one point, 19 seconds to download. So this likecool.com was blocked for rendering for 20 seconds. Uh, wow, I have more. Uh, here's one, everything took a long time, except for Google. <laughs> Trying to save my job. Uh, we've got Facebook, Twitter, uh, core metrics, all took you know, 5, 8, 10. There was something going on here, I don't know what. But because they are blocking scripts, they're loaded synchronously, uh, the page is blocked for rendering. So like, this is just you know, some of the more popular examples from the last, uh, well, the May 1st run of HTTP Archive. So this is happening all the time to some percentage of your users. Um, and it's unfortunate because it's not that hard to work around it. So what's kind of funny was um, I just did this talk for the first time uh, a couple of weeks ago at the new Fluent JavaScript conference. It was May 30th when I did the talk. And I swear I had nothing to do with this, but the next day, Facebook went down. <laughs> so here's a chart from uh, a, a metrics company. I think it's, um, it's not Catchpoint. Who is it? Uh, yeah, Catchpoint, uh, where they were tracking various Facebook. They do this all the time. Uh, just for reasons like this. They were tracking all these different Facebook domains. And www.facebook.com on May 31st for a few hours had very high response times. It was basically unresponsive. It was timing out. So uh, I mentioned before about I should have come up with a catch your name, the front end spoff. Um, so for you know two years, I've been banging this drum. And I think it's a pretty serious drum to bang. And there have been outages like this since then where people who own third-party widgets that do synchronous blocking in hundreds of thousands of popular websites go down, and those sites go down. They fail. They have front-end spoff. And like the media has just missed it. Like, oh, yeah, you know, big website X went down. No one could read their mail or you know, talk to their friends or socialize on their social networks. And they're completely missing the point that all these other websites are also brought to their knees. This time, this was the first time that I really saw people catch it. And so I'm really proud. Like I'm, I'm proud this performance community is getting more intelligent. The reason they did it was there were three performance companies that pointed out this outage and how it had this ripple effect across the entire internet. And so we see some pretty big news portals. Forbes talking about Facebook outage slowed thousands of retail content sites. 
uh, PC world, as Facebook service goes, so goes the internet um, and TechCrunch. Uh, yesterday's Facebook outage also slowed down major media and retail sites. And then we get charts like this that correlate the uh, Facebook outage spikes with um, response times for these different websites that are not Facebook websites, but they have the like button or uh, some widget, some Facebook widget in them. And so this is happening maybe 0.1% of, of the time to users randomly. But when one of these major third-party widget portals goes down, it's happening to all your users, right? So I don't know if you had any Facebook widgets in your site and if you were loading them synchronously or asynchronously. But on May 31st, if you were loading them synchronously, your users were looking at a blank page for 20 to 120 seconds. So this is a, a very depressing tale of woe and foreboding. Um, but there is a bright side, because that's me, Mr. Brightside. Uh, we can have this. Exp so the first thing is, um, if we want to find a way to avoid this problem, how can we recreate the problem? So we can do something like this. We can always test our sites um, from China and see if any of the things that are you know, blocked, Twitter and stuff, are slowing down our page. Um, but that's pretty random. Even the rules on what gets blocked by the firewall can change on a day-to-day -day basis. So what Patrick Meenan did when I wrote that blog post about being in Beijing and having it blocked, he said, well, we should have a public black hole that we can use for this kind of testing. So he created blackhole.webpagetest.org. And now that you have a black hole, you can do something like this in your Etsy host file or wherever your Etsy host file is, if you're on Windows or whatever. Um, you can just map whatever domain you want to check, if it could potentially block, spoff your site. You can just add it to the host file and map the IP to the black hole. And you can see if that thing doesn't return, what happens to your page? Does your page continue to render? Or does it get blocked? How much of it gets blocked? Um, the other thing you can do is you can also use uh, web page tests as a very simple scripting language. So you don't have to rely on the firewall blocking things. You can just use this set DNS name and give it the DNS that you want to see if you're uh, liable for spoff and map it to the black hole domain. And so you could do something like this when you're setting up a test. You can click on the script tag copy and paste those lines in there, add other domains if you want to test them, and then whatever, navigate to whatever URL for your website that you want to test. So this is a much more reliable way to test if your site is, uh, could be subjected to front-end spoff. So around the same time, I decided to add a Twitter widget to my website, and, you know, I. Uh, of course, I'm interested in, in practicing what I preach. Um, luckily, most of the things I talk about are easy to implement, so uh, I can try to do that. So I added this, and I ran it through a web page test using that black hole, mapping twitter.com to that black hole. And this is what we see. It's kind of maybe not quite the fail, front end spot failure from before, but to me, it's still a failure. So what we see is this is where the Twitter widget should be. And we see that I start rendering pretty quickly. I start rendering under two seconds. But even at 20 seconds, the page has stopped rendering here. And the third column, you can see a third column and some other content here. Those are all blocked. Why is that? Well, like I said, everything below the script tag. Now, in this case, I'm kind of lucky. I've put the Twitter script tag about halfway in my page. So everything above that Twitter script tag was able to render the blog post, uh, my books. Those are hugely important. Hopefully, everyone here has bought those. Um, but then everything after that is blocked from rendering. So this is still a pretty serious failure, uh, you know, liability in my world. Um, so I don't like that. So I think, OK, well, what can I do? So I've, I, now I have tools I can test with. And I've confirmed I have this liability. What can I do about that? So, oh yeah, and here we see finally at 30 seconds after these timeout, uh, it renders the rest of the page. The Twitter widget will never render because it's being sent to this black hole. It's never going to respond. It's just I'm waiting for it to time out so the page isn't blocked from rendering anymore. Is there a way that I can avoid that going forward? So uh, here's the snippet from Twitter. So unfortunately, it's a blocking synchronous pattern. Uh, script source equals blah. 
And then I uh, call into that code and create the widget with some parameters. Um, so I want to change that. The first thing I can do is I can adopt that same asynchronous pattern for loading scripts, right? It's very simple. Uh, it works in all browsers, so that's very cool. And when I load the page, I get a undefined symbol error. Because after it runs this code, it goes to load the script. It might take a while for that to come back. It doesn't wait. It immediately goes on and calls this function, TWTR, this symbol. And it's not defined, because that TWTR is defined inside widget.js. So this is where I was talking about when we do things asynchronously, we have to change our coding patterns a little bit. So that's not too hard. I'll just add a callback. So uh, I'll add an onload handler to the code that's loading the script. And then I'll wrap that TWTR code inside a callback function. I have to do some funky stuff here to not call it twice and to handle IE and stuff like that. But um, it's not that much code, really. So you know, I went from five lines of code to 15 lines of code. And now it's working asynchronously, hunky-dory. Except you can't do asynchronous loading with scripts that contain document.write. Because the browser, if you do it asynchronously, is going to charge ahead, rendering the DOM. And then finally, this script is going to return. And it's going to try to do a document.write way back up here. And the browser is going to crash, or it's going to wipe out the entire page. It's really not known what it's going to do. No browser except for Opera allow you to do that document.write up higher in the DOM after you've already passed it and gone through. So like, I'm kind of stuck here. I'm looking at the source code, and I notice it only does the document.write of this div, where it's going to stuff all the uh, widget stuff, if there's no ID uh, property for x. What's x? x is that um, hash of fields that I'm passing into the API. So if I pass in an, a an ID, I'm guessing it's not going to do document.write. So I go back to my code, and I just add a ID parameter. And the ID is for a div that I create right above the script. So I create the div myself so the widget doesn't have to. I don't think they've documented this part of uh, the API, but it's actually a really good pattern to have the uh, person pasting the snippet create the DOM element that the content's going to go into, and then just go on your merry way. You can avoid document.write in most cases that way. And sure enough, it works. And this is what we had before. You know, nothing rendered uh, below the Twitter widget for 30 seconds. But now, in the new pattern, stuff renders at just two seconds, right? If this comes back, it will fill in. But if it doesn't come back, then the page isn't blocked from rendering. So you can do this. It would be good if people who gave out widgets would do this. But even if they don't, if you care about it, you can do it yourself. It's usually not that hard. So how come these guys didn't do it? It's interesting. It's clear that they understand these principles. Um, while placing JavaScript files at the bottom of the page is best practice for website performance, from book number one. <laughs> when including the anywhere.js file, always place the file as close to the top of the page as possible? <laughs> oh, you got to be kidding me. I mean, they know that this is bad. They know it's bad. But they're actually saying, we know it's bad, but go ahead and do it. Because the file is small. It's only 3K. Yeah, but if it times out, it doesn't matter if it's 3K or 30K or 300K. It's timing out. It's going to block the page. Um, all the other dependencies are loaded asynchronously. That's great, but you still have one dependency. And to tell you the truth, if uh, Facebook is down, whether I have one or 10, it's all the same. It's not very likely that I'm going to have 10 face or Twitter widgets uh, or Google or Facebook uh, resources. And one of them is going to time out, but the other are going to work. You really have to be all or nothing here, right? So um, clearly, they're missing some things. And, and this is a segue into, I'm going to close out here in the next five or 10, uh, into something I was uh, working on the last couple weeks. Um, so they mention about how small this script is. Well, um, one thing we know, we know that failures happen. Like all of these sites go down, right? And if nothing else, there's hiccups on the internet. So we know failures happen. We know for these blocking scripts that it really doesn't matter 
whether I'm doing a conditional GET request, like I have it in my cache, I have Google Analytics or widget.js or all.js, I have it in the cache, but it's expired, so I'm going to do a conditional GET request and see if I need to update it. It doesn't matter whether I'm doing a conditional GET request or just a bare bones GET request. Whether I get back a 200 response or a 304 response, the browser is going to wait there and wait for that response to come back for that script if the script is loaded using a synchronous pattern. So it doesn't matter whether it's in the cache or not if it has to be checked. And anywhere.js, the Twitter one, expires after 15 minutes. So it means there's going to be a lot of conditional GET requests for this resource. After 15 minutes, it's going to be in my cache, but it's expired. So I have to do a the browser has to do a conditional GET request to see if it's um, still valid or not. And that's the same as if there's nothing in the cache. So it doesn't matter that it's small. It, as long as it's in the cache and expired, it still has the potential to, do, to generate front-end spoof. So this is what, typically what happens for widgets, is they, they have a bootstrap script, like all.js, widget.js, ga.js. They have a bootstrap script that loads other things. But these bootstrap scripts have, it's the initial script, that's why I call it a bootstrap script, have very short cache times. Uh, widget.js, 30 minutes all.js 15 minutes, uh, Google, GA.js 120 minutes. I think we just increased this to 12 hours, which is better. Um, so why do they have these short cache times? The reason is that, uh, uh, so they have short cache times. The reason is that if there's an emergency fix to the script, the, and it was cacheable for a week, it would take a week before every user in the world got the updated version of that script. So some third party content owner is asking people to copy and paste this snippet into their page. And once that happens, there's no way for this third party content owner to update the other person's website. So since there's no way to update it, they say, well, we'll just make it cacheable for only 15 minutes. And every 15 minutes, it will check and see if there's a new version. Well, the problem is if there's an outage for one of these third party portals, then that 304 conditional get check is still going to cause front end spoff. So is there a way that we could uh, avoid this, this? They have short cache times, which means they're more likely to generate conditional get requests. Um, but, um, and that's going to generate front end spoff. But if we don't generate a lot of conditional get requests, then uh, there's no way for the snippet owners to get their updates out there. So. I was working with Stoyan, and I think we found a way to do this. So I call it uh, self-updating bootstrap scripts. You know, I don't think that's as good as some of the other photos, but just the quality of it, I like it. <laughs> I don't know. I found, I could not find any good pictures of bootstraps on Flickr. <laughs> From, yeah. So uh, let me walk through how it works really quick. Almost out of time. So uh, you have a client, and let's say it's called bootstrap.js. You know, I know Twitter has a bootstrap.js. I'm not trying to, I'm just saying it's a generic bootstrap script. So uh, there's some website that has my snippet in it, and it's called bootstrap.js. And um, when, the, when their page loads, uh, uh, bootstrap.js is requested. And it returns a 200. And let's say uh, I make it cacheable for a week. Right now, these scripts are cacheable for about 15 minutes. But what this new pattern allows me to do is make even the initial bootstrap script cacheable for a longer period of time. I'm not going to go crazy in case there's a bug out there. I just created this like a few weeks ago. So I'm going to make it a week. So it's cacheable for a week. And this is what's inside bootstrap.js. It knows what version of itself it is. I'm currently on version 1.7 of bootstrap.js. And now it's going to do some stuff. It could do a snippet. In this case, let's suppose it's just doing some kind of metrics and logging sort of thing. So instead of sending an image beacon back, it's going to send back a JavaScript beacon. It's going to create a script element, document.createElement script. It's going to set the source and append it to the DOM. Um, JavaScript beacon, beacon.js. And it's going to include the version number in the URL. So now, after bootstrap.js gets loaded, parsed, and executed, it's going to fire off beacon.js. 
and that's going to have the version number in the query string and maybe some logging information or something like that. And the server is going to return a 204, right? Because there's nothing to return. Oh, I got the logging information. 204 is just more efficient. So everything's hunky-dory, and this has gone just fine. But now, suppose I push a, an update to Bootstrap, and I'm up to version 1.8, but it's only the next day. Bootstrap.js is still cacheable for another six days. But there's a new version out there. If I set a 15-minute expiration time, I'd get the update. But I don't want to do that for performance reasons. So here's how we can get around that. Same thing happens. Uh, instead of doing an HTTP request, bootstrap.js is just read from cache. It gathers whatever metrics it's counting. It fires off beacon.js. And this time, the server says, oh, you're at 1.7. I'm at 1.8. Instead of returning a 204 no content, I'm going to return this JavaScript code, because it's a JavaScript file. And it's going to load an iframe, an iframe for update.php. It's not visible, so you don't have to worry about that. So now update.php is going to be requested, and it's going to return a 200. And basically, all it does is it includes bootstrap.js and code to reload itself once. Because when you reload a page, it requests every resource in that page, even if that resource is in the cache. That's the point of the reload button. And this is true across every browser that I've looked at. So what happens is this code comes back. And update.php is loaded. It has bootstrap.js, but that's read from cache. But then the reload happens. And when the reload happens, bootstrap.js is re-requested over the network, and it overwrites the version. Version 1.8 overwrites the version that's in the cache. So now I've updated this bootstrap script without having to set a short expiration time. So I've had my cake, and I can eat it too. So this is pretty new. I think it's big. I'm going to encourage snippet owners to adopt it as a pattern. Um, two caveats. It's kind of like app cache. You don't see the updated version until the next page view. Um, and there was one reported IE8 issue, but no one has re that was like three weeks ago, and no one has seen it since I was unable to recreate it. Um, and what's cool is the folks at LogNormal uh, that I know from Yahoo adopted this right away. Uh, they have something like Google Analytics, and they've been running it for weeks. And he reported some bugs, and we made a couple fixes. And he just wrote a blog post yesterday or the day before. And one thing they've been trying to deal with is um, there's a lot of malformed caches and proxies out in the world. And so even though they update their code and it has a fairly short cache time, like a week, um, they're still seeing versions of the code from back in February Browsers out in the real world are still using these old versions of the code because they're behind a proxy that's misconfigured, that isn't honoring the expiration date. So this is a problem every big website runs into. And so he's been focusing on that. And because this code self-updates itself, they've actually seen an 87% reduction in these old versions coming in um, since they adopted this self-updating pattern. So that's another benefit of this that I actually didn't anticipate. You can actually reach in behind all of those misconfigured proxies and get updates to happen on the client itself. So it's working pretty well. I think it's good. So I think that's about it. And that's good. I'm about out of time. Um, takeaways, uh, anything that you don't own, even stuff you do own, load async. But certainly, anything you don't own, load it asynchronously. Make sure you don't have front end spoff. Uh, test your site with uh, web page test black hole. Um, this is a point I didn't mention. Uh, most real user metrics um, take the page load time at onload. If the page is taking 20 to 120 seconds to load, uh, to hit onload, users aren't waiting for that. So if you look at your, you can't rely on your real user metrics, uh, real user monitoring, to detect a front end spoff, because most users aren't going to wait for that onload event to fire. So you should have a timeout on your run. If the page hasn't loaded in 10 seconds, then go ahead and register that as a failure. Um, and if you own a Bootstrap script, uh, try out this self-updating pattern. Then the last things I wanted to say next week, uh, Mike mentioned, is Velocity. Hope to see a lot of you there. Um, and the day after Velocity on Thursday is the first ever WebPerf days. This is kind of a model after DevOps days. And we hope to, we hope to uh, 
uh, have this happen more and more around the world. We've already scheduled it for London when we're there um, in October. Uh, so many of you here on the East Coast, you might want to just take a jump across the pond to London in October. Uh, so Sergey just handed me these 20% discount codes for Velocity. I'll tell you on the down low, like, if you want to go and you haven't registered yet, you might not get in. Like, you should register tonight. So here's a discount code if you want some. And I think that's it. Thank you. All right, question, Sergey. Uh, it's not it's a comment. We actually had a Meet for Speed session at Business Insider. So they are aware of all of these and work on it. Uh, hopefully tomorrow some of them will be at the meeting. Okay, <laughs> cool. Uh, so yeah, we'll take some questions. Yes, in the back. Yeah. Um, so the first question was, async and defer, are they useful? Um, yeah, I didn't go into those too much. You, can, you don't have to use this complicated pattern. Um, you can just say async, uh, use the async attribute to the script tag, and that will cause it to kind of behave the way we see with the Google Analytics uh, snippet. Um, and then if you say defer, it will um, defer, it will do the download, but it will defer the execution until the entire page is done parsing. A big difference between those two is async, if you have multiple scripts that depend on each other, async does not guarantee that they'll be executed in order. Defer does guarantee that. Um, so if you have multiple scripts, you might want to use defer. Um, and then the second question was about loading bootstrap.js twice. So in this case, it, I was kind of modeling after something like Google Analytics, but it could also be a snippet sort of thing. But um, often the way I think what you were getting at is, or asking about is, so bootstrap.js was loaded and parsed and executed uh, once in the main page, and then if there's an update, it's actually uh, loaded, the old version is loaded in the iframe, and then the new version is loaded again. Um, so could there be a problem with that? Well, you have to decide. Most of the time, like what we saw with the Twitter pattern or with Google Analytics, is it's not just the script itself. There's then some code you have to call, like new TWTR or GAC push for Google Analytics. So in your iframe, if you don't have any of that code that actually like exercises the functionality of the Bootstrap script, then most likely nothing will happen. Um, but you'd have to think about that for your own case. Thanks. Any other questions? Yes. Yeah. Yeah, you can't. The question was, how do you deal with document.write? Um, this was a really easy one that I figured out just by looking at the code. Yeah, there's really, uh, so there are people like uh, Ghostwriter from Digital Fulcrum. They have a library. Uh, Cloudflare, I think, has tried to solve this, where they basically override document.write. But um, the biggest case where document.write rears its ugly head is with ads. And with ads, you never know what's going to happen. And so all of those solutions have, like, if, document dot, if the code in document.write was printing the number of DOM elements in the page, if you don't execute it right at the time that it's supposed to be executed, you're going to get different output than if you defer, if you override document.write and defer it to be executed later. So, you, you know, if it's document.write that you own, maybe you can figure it out. But otherwise, yeah, there's really no easy solution for that. Call up the, the, the provider of that third-party widget and um, tell them you, don't, you want a version that doesn't use document.write. Yeah, Sergey was saying you can put it in an iframe. And at least then it, it will still block the onload event from happening of the page if there's like a front-end spoff. Um, but it won't block the rendering of the main page. Kellen. So what do you think the most applications of this updatable thing are really more about performance around the search like mobile? So now you've got a beacon and then a second beacon and then an iframe. Do you recommend this in mobile as performance? Um, so the question is, uh, 
you know, mobile has um, s typically slower connection speeds. People are also paying for data potentially. Um, would I recommend this pattern for uh, people on mobile? Well, it's going to be hard to have like a pat one pattern for desktop and one pattern for mobile. The reason I'm not so, in addition to what you mentioned, um, what I'm really trying to do is get this thing in the cache on mobile. And unfortunately, mobile caches right now are really small. So there's less potential benefit of getting the new version in cache. If the user doesn't come back like within a day, it might not even be there. So it's less compelling for mobile. Um, but I don't think, uh, I didn't mention this, but the iframe update.php, that can actually just be a static HTML file. So um, the first time you load it, it can just be loaded from cache. And the second time when you hit reload, it actually would be downloaded again. So really, and the beacon, um, kind of the assumption of this pattern is that the widget you're installing already sends something every time. And so like Google Analytics, every time sends a beacon. All we're doing is piggybacking on that. Uh, the Twitter widget, every time sends a JSON request. All we're doing is piggybacking on that. So the only additional requests are um, in the best case, one request for update.php and one request for the new version of the script. So it's not that bad. So yeah, I would do it. Connection will probably be reused as well. Yeah, we would reuse connections. Yeah. Any other questions? OK, um, with Mike's, per oh, one more? Well, I was going to do um, I was going to do a fun thing. Can I do a fun thing? Sure. Okay. <laughs> okay. So, this is kind of related, um, but uh, not really. Okay, so this is the latest thing that I'm working on, and this is only the second time that I've demoed it uh, publicly. But um, I have some books to give away, and I wanted to try to figure out a way to do that going forward. And um, I need a place to try to demo this before I go to like a big conference like Velocity or something like that. So I thought a uh, you know kind of meetup group, kind of informal thing, people would be a little more forgiving. Um, so let's try it. We'll call this party name. Uh, code for craft, and it's started by Steve. Okay, so I want everyone uh, to take out your phone and go to partyline.org. And I guess I'll do that here. And this is what you should see. Uh, just go ahead and join the party. Yeah. Well, I mean, it's got the logo up there, party line. So the tagline is um, connecting mobile crowds. So I feel like there's this opportunity where um, there are crowds of people at sporting events, concert, bars, uh, conferences, and a lot of the people have phones. And so I want to, I'm always interested in trying to increase the amount of interaction that I can have with um, people uh, in the audience. And so I was thinking of ways to do that. And so this is a way to do it. So the party comes from participate. <laughs> oh yeah, oh yeah, you laugh now, this is big. Okay, so uh, let's see, let me go uh, back here. And I should be able to update. So, wow, 90 people. So, uh, how many people are on the Wi-Fi? Yeah, so this is pretty network intensive. So that's good that not a lot of people are on the Wi-Fi. So, um, no one sees this admin interface, so that's why it's particularly bad. Not that the client UI is much better. So, I can do a lot of fun things here, like I can do this. Yeah. And I can do this. 
Yeah? Nothing's working for you? Yeah. Okay. I think this one is cool. Did your phone go blank? Shaking the browser. Okay. All right. I think that's pretty cool. I think that's pretty cool. Fennec, I know who that is. Oh, okay. I think that's pretty cool. I love that. Okay, uh, so now let's see, let's do this. Uh, I'm gonna give every phone a unique ID and then um, we'll do this. So everyone, uh, hold your phone up. That's kind of cool. That's kind of cool. Some people aren't getting it though. You can hit, oh, look at this. You don't even have to hit reload. Guess what I can do? I can reload your phone from here. <laughs> Is that freaky? Like, that's freaky. Okay, but what I wanted to do was I wanted to give away these books. And, uh, oh, here we go. Here we go. All right, I'm way over time. How many people are bored? Okay. Uh, okay. Let's see. Uh, um, what's the best web performance tool, in my opinion? Pick an answer. <laughs> All right, let's see what the answers say. Yeah, I think web page test is the best tool. Weisslow is pretty good. PageSpeed actually is very good too. So that's kind of interesting. Um, here, let's do this. Do you use Weisslow on a regular basis? That's pretty cool. Let's see, let me update the member count. I think we have, so a lot of people aren't replying or it's just not working. <laughs> Both of those are possible. Okay, but now let's try to give away the books, okay. Um, okay, so I want to, uh, I want you to keep track of how many answers you get correct. Um, I haven't built the functionality to do that automatically yet, so, you're, 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 I'm trusting you. Um, okay, so what's, what's better uh, to use when you're um, loading a script dynamically? A pen child or insert before? To attach the script to the DOM, you've got to use one of those. All right, you want one more time? Insert before is better, yeah. Okay, so keep track of your correct answers. Even if you got that one wrong, you might not be out of it. I'm telling you, like I'm not, I'm not kidding here. Like there's books up here. <laughs> right? Like. <laughs> yeah, oh. <laughs> I don't have 39 books with me. Okay, um, oh, let's see, I need help on this one. Okay, in my closing slide, um, that was a picture of 
Which bridge? I think I misspelled one. Which bridge do you think was in the closing slide of my slide deck? All right. Oh, Verrazano is correct. Yes, Verrazano Narrows Bridge. Okay. Um, let's see. Let's do another one of these. Uh, No, that's not a good one. <laughs> okay. How many mi minutes is widgets.js cacheable for? The answer is 30. Okay, so when I, like, there better not be more than eight people who come up and say they got every question right, okay? There's an upper bound here. Okay, I think this is the last one I'm going to ask. And then I'll ask for all the winners to come up and we'll see if we have to do a push-up contest or something like that. Okay. I'm going to type in the answers, but I haven't asked the question yet. So don't. So don't press a button, you might get it wrong. So I asked this question at Food Camp and it was amazing. I'll tell you the distribution of answers after you guys answer. My favorite undergraduate class was uh, Judgment Under Uncertainty, Heuristics and Biases. So uh, as we know, about half the babies born are girls and half are boys. So these statisticians went out and they looked at a uh, hospital in the city, big hospital. They have 500 babies a day. And they tracked how many babies and uh, how many baby girls, how many baby boys each day. And then they went to a hospital in the country that only had 50 babies a day. And they did similar stats. So the question is, in which hospital are they more likely to see 60% of the babies being born as boys? in the big city hospital, the small country hospital, or is it equal across both? All right. Last chance, answer, answer. Wow, you guys did a lot better. So the answer is in the country hospital because of the law of small numbers. Small populations are more likely to deviate from the norm. Um, so I was just at a uh, food camp and each one, it was about uh, a third for each answer, uh, which I thought was kind of interesting. <laughs> That's about what I wanted to do with this. It actually worked better than I expected, and I appreciate you um, tolerating that. And so now, um, uh, let's have uh, anyone get them all right. Yes, come on up. Does anyone know, is this guy somewhat trustworthy? Uh, you know him? Okay. All right, let's see. Let's see, I'll give you... Let's see. I'll give you a choice. Yeah, okay, thank you. And then uh, I have another one, and uh, just for simplicity, I'm going to give it to the woman who has a Fennec browser. And uh, 
you know, as you can tell, I like to have fun. What? No, no, no. This is a different. This is a special one. Uh, so as you can tell, I like to have fun. This was a lot of fun, uh, and I'm just really stoked to know people from Etsy. I get to work with John Allspa as Velocity co-chair all the time, and uh, Etsy is just pumping a lot of positive karma into the web world. Thanks very much for doing that. I wanted to give this one to Mike Britton for hosting me here at Coda's Craft. Thanks, and we're done. Thank you.